Should we shut that door? <laughs> no, no. People leave the door open so people walk in. So it is now 5.10, so we are going to get started. Um, folks are all encouraged to move towards the front because this is primarily for you to ask questions. The presentation is really short, right? So if folks can't hear me, move forwards because I will mumble throughout the talk, and that is a threat. Oh, you've raised your hand already, sure. Uh, what's the open enclave SD call? That is what the five slides I have will answer in not so great detail. My job is done. Your job <laughs> is done. Thank you, plant. I will pay you later. Um, so we're just going to get started right now. I'm assuming folks here are mostly from the open source summit side of things. Is anybody here from the security summit? Okay. All, all the ringers can leave now. <laughs> um, but for the open source summit people, were folks at the keynote, do you guys know what the confidential consortium stuff is, confidential computing consortium stuff is? Do the words trusted execution environment mean anything to any of you? Okay, good. Good number of hands. Ringers don't count. Ringers don't count. Um, so, okay, we'll, we'll go through a bunch of that detail, hopefully fairly quickly. So just to motivate a bunch of this stuff, right? Like before we even get to what the Open Enclave SDK is, we should probably un explain a little bit of the problem space it lives in. We should probably get to who we were as well. I'm Andy from Microsoft, and this is Simon, my sure. colleague. <laughs> we're unimportant. We're just <laughs> puppets for... Just so you know who you're talking to. Yes. So we can go back a slide. No. That, yes. So Simon. Andy, next slide. Um, so again, we're just going to skip through a bunch of this stuff, right? So everybody knows security today. If you work in Linux environments, a lot of it is just around how do you secure your data when it's sitting on someone's hard drive somewhere. Lots and lots of technologies available for that already. All variants of that technology are available. You can encrypt things on a block device basis. You can encrypt databases. You can encrypt on a file system basis. Pretty much a solved problem. Lots and lots of solutions for, there for you to use, right? If you're talking about sort of uh, microservices and how you actually deploy applications in the cloud today, the other thing you have to solve, of course, is how does your data get to this place? And we have lots and lots of solutions in that space as well. Sort of the de facto standard, if you use internet at all, that's going to be transport layer security, uh, TLS or HTTPS. Um, there are more esoteric protocols you can also employ if you want to. We, that's also another place where it's sort of a buyer's market, right? Lots of things for you to be able to do. Um, Sort of what we're talking about when we mention this, this magical term of confidential computing is what do you do if you want to have secrets which are being computed on a machine that you don't own and you want those secrets to remain secret? So the obvious example of this is we now have these major cloud providers. We have Azure, we have Google, we have Amazon. Uh, you want to run your enterprise applications on these cloud providers, but the traditional model of security is if I own the machine, I can do lots of things to that machine. I own the operating system that you're running on. I may have admin rights. The operator has admin rights to this thing. Um, I can dump your memory pages, right? Like your application may be running just fine. It may be malware-free. But how do you trust that no one who has access to the device or the operating system has access to your data as well? And so there's this sort of new uh, area where you actually want encryption, right? You kind of want your data to be encrypted so that even when it's running, even when it's being computed over, no one else should be able to see your data except presumably your application, right? And so this idea of being able to protect your data while it's in use is, is sort of this new space that we're trying to refer to. And there are other technologies, and there are a couple of different technologies in this space. Some of them are pretty nascent. Um, homomorphic encryption has been around for a really long time. In academia, it's about 20 years at this point, I think. Um, it's not really taken off because there are lots of severe limitations on what it can do efficiently today. If you happen... That's not, not the vision yet. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Seriously, that was, has been a problem. Yes, they can do division. So the set of operations, yeah. It's, it's really about the set of operations, right? It's not even, we're not even talking about algorithms yet. It's like the set of operations you can do efficiently on encrypted data is just very restricted today. So if you happen to have a problem that that can solve for you, congratulations, that's kind of the gold standard. But the vast majority of applications just don't have that benefit today. Um, the other technology that's sort of been emergent over the last five to 10 years are these things we call trusted execution environments. And that's really the idea of using hardware. So you're sort of way below the stack. You're below the hypervisor. You're below the kernel operating system. But that piece of hardware is going to give you a, a promise that 
while it's going to compute on all of your information in a decrypted form, which means that you can use all the regular operations that you expect to be able to do, the hardware is going to promise you that no one else can see your data, not the kernel, not the hypervisor. It's that level of protection where it's effectively your data is only encrypted and only your application gets to see it. Right? Um, and so when we talk about these TEEs, there's really a sort of a set of primitives that they all kind of do, right? So if I have this trusted execution environment, the question becomes, how do I run applications in this? Like, well, the assumption is you're going to have some magical way of basically calling functions that run in this environment. How do you do that, right? How do you set up and how do you create this environment? Well, you've got to tell someone to make this thing for you. There's a set of CPU instructions or hardware-specific protocols that you run to be able to set up one of these things. Uh, once you have this thing running, how do you know that it's running inside this environment? I could be running an emulator, right? If you are remoting into this piece of software, what do you do to figure out that you're actually running against a trusted execution environment, specifically running the code of your choice that you trust? So the notions of attestation are really important there. And if you've used, for example, SE Linux before, uh, the idea of being able to attest, like, the the set of hardware that you're running, the set of firmware you're running machine, plus the set of software that you want to run on that. Those become basically intrinsic operations to what you want to be able to do when you run an application inside one of these trusted execution environments. Um, and finally, like, if you're familiar with TPMs, are anybody not familiar with what a TPM is in this room? Question? Uh, trusted platform modules. So basically, a, a small hardware module that provides you uh, private keys which are hardware bound, right? And one of the major operations that you can do with these TPMs is basically to do uh, identity, where you can say, I have a unique identifier, and therefore I know this machine has this hardware bound identity. And also you can seal secrets to this because it has its own set of keys that's not available to any other machine, right? And so sealing is one of these interesting primitives that you want to be able to do with these trusted execution environments as well. So. That sort of trinity of things, or rather four sort of operations, being able to create, being able to call functions, being able to attest a TEE, and then being able to do sealing operations, right? Um, those are kind of things that we think are kind of fundamental to how you think about writing a program across all of these different trusted execution environments. And that's really the problem that this SDK that we call the Open Enclave SDK is trying to solve, right? So Enclave is kind of, was kind of derived from Intel's implementation of this trusted execution environment technology today, uh, where you can think of the Enclave as a term for ATEE, right? The Open Enclave SDK itself, though, tries to generalize that. So Intel does have a very efficient and fully featured um, SDK for writing applications against the Intel SGX platform today. Uh, SGX stands for Software Guard Extensions. Um, but we also expect that there are going to be a lot more of these platforms in the future. Um, even software-based ones. I believe yesterday we had a similar talk. Someone was asking about virtualization-based security, right? Um, you can think of trusted execution environments as being uh, an application model where there is this notion that you will do some portion of your computation in this special memory space that's protected for you, and there's the rest of your application. So if you're familiar with doing things like RPC, where you have something that's less trusted than something that you RPC into for more trusted operation, that's a very similar kind of model. Um, specifically for the Open Enclave SDK, uh, we care that it is going to deal with these different kinds of TEEs on your behalf. So imagine if there is a different platform in the future. Right now, for example, we are in the process of integrating ARM Trust Zone as one of the things that you can automatically take an application that's written for the Open Enclave SDK and run it against the Intel SGX SDK, uh, sorry, the Intel SGX platform, as well as the ARM Trust Zone platform. Um, was that a question? Sorry, no. Okay. Um, and so, sorry. You touched on the virtual machine approach. Is uh, OpenSDK structured to be somewhat agnostic to process versus VM approach? Or so for, establishment? Uh, clarify that boundary establishment in what sense? Uh, the two different models. The yeah, the, so for example, are you thinking about the AMD uh, SEV model? Right, so for this one, we're currently much more, it's a much lower level abstraction at this point. Um, the AMD SEV model, I will point to <laughs> Anarchs because they, that's something that they have explicitly tried to address. Um, I think Asylo has also tried to address that space um, to a different extent. Um, 
But the primary model that we're dealing with today, somebody because Trust Zone is one of the first other pieces that we're going for, is really for restricted, very small applications, right? So imagine um, the memory model for Intel's SGX today, for example, is single process, restricted memory address space that happens to live within the same process as the untrusted uh, host process, right? And so you have a benefit there, potentially, where there's a shared memory model where you have a higher trust uh, sort of application running inside the Enclave that has access to both memory spaces, right? Um, the VM model has other benefits that we'll talk about. Like you can basically, there's more of a lift and shift approach, right? Like you're running a VM, and if you have the keys that basically allow you to uh, encrypt the memory used by that VM, then you're trusting fewer things in that regard. We're trying to scope this down to something that's very, very low level right now. The SDK itself runs for C and C++, and it's primarily targeted at people who really care about reducing the trusted computing base for the application. So again, you could take a whole application and run it inside an environment, but you still have a bunch of other security considerations there, right? Like, are you using memory in an appropriate way that doesn't involve side channels? Are you using a bunch of memory you know, um, operations that then themselves become a side channel? So the less things you have in this very constrained, protected memory space, the better. And so, at least in the current incarnation, the Open Enclave SDK is sort of optimized towards those sort of um, single process experiences. We'll talk a little bit more about where it's going, just in terms of building compatibility, uh, building additional support for POSIX and these other things. Um, so that's the first piece, C++, low level SDK, primarily sort of focused on just doing that integration with the different uh, hardware providers for TEs today. Uh, the other thing, of course, is we want to, we're at <laughs> OSS Summit because it is a fully open source project. And that's really an important consideration, right? If you are going to be writing TEs in the future, you kind of want to know that all the code that goes in this application that you're running, someone has looked at, someone has, has the ability to audit every line of code that's in this thing that is handling your secrets supposedly in a trusted way. And so there is, there is definitely a dedication to this project will remain open source, it's made fully transparent. And we now have a governance model that Andy will talk about in a bit, um, where we are encouraging people to basically shape it. Like, what do you need these things to do for your applications? Uh, finally, Open Enclave SDK is also a little bit unique in the sense that we're trying to support multiple operating systems as well. So we are from Microsoft, uh, caveat given there. So in addition to supporting Linux, which is the primary operating system that's supported by this SDK, we will also try to support uh, Windows uh, as an operating system that you can run these kinds of applications on from the host side. Uh, specifically, also trying to support binary compatibility. So if you've written an application in Linux, or at least the trusted application portion of that, you can just take that and actually just run it on Windows without having to recompile it. <laughs> so these are kinds of things that we're thinking of that space. Specifically for the ARM trust zone uh, side of things right now, it's running on a sort of specialized system for these kinds of trusted measurements called the OPTE OS. Um, so this is basically sort of the, the principles that we're building this Open Enclave SDK under. And I will turn it over to Andy. So as Simon pointed out, today was the first day of the Open Source Summit, and I want to highlight the first part of the name of our SDK. It is the Open Enclave SDK. Um, this has been publicly available since October last year. It's published out on GitHub under an MIT license. We're working really hard to build the community. We want this to be an SDK not just by us for people to use, but by the users themselves to contribute with us and help us shape like the future of this project. Um, as of July, which means that these numbers are a little out of date. Uh, there were already over 2,000 commits for, I think now at six releases since we published it. Uh, we've got 40 contributors, mostly at Microsoft, but they've been cross-team at least, and we really would like that to expand to be cross-company and just across the industry. Um, there's been activity. We've got 70 forks and 210 stars. I'm hoping that I can leave here tonight after two of these boffs and the mention of the fact that we'll be donating this to the um, intended to form Confidential Computing Consortium, and I want to see those numbers go up. I think that was pretty good considering we went pretty quietly last year, and now here's the big loud announcement about um, these cool projects that are happening. Uh, so this is a continuously active project. We've got lots of commits coming in. We have lots of people working on it. Um, we've formed like a community maintenance committee and we'll be having open community forums to speak in. There's a Gitter channel you can hop in on. Uh, we encourage people to open issues and pull requests with us. Um, there's a suggested design review document. If you have a feature that you'd like to discuss, you can fill out 
a pull request with a template of what you want it to look like and who it would be for. And we want to do all of these decisions in the open with the community. And that is the open part of the Open Enclave SDK here. So also to emphasize the fact that we, we are getting usage of the SDK just in terms of, again, it started off Microsoft. So you'll see, for example, that there are other projects that have really taken the dependency on the Open Enclave SDK. Another one that you can actually find on the public uh, GitHub site is the uh, Confidential Consortium Framework. So if you go to github.com slash Microsoft slash CCF, um, this is basically an application that allows you to build like open source uh, consortium-based frameworks based on top of these trusted execution environments. And then you can use, for example, an Ethereum-based engine to build a blockchain application of your choice on top of these, right? So we really are positioning ourselves sort of as, this is not the solution that we will push onto you for building your kinds of applications. We are trying to enable people to build more interesting kinds of applications on top of this framework, right? And so we're really interested in the kinds of things that people do want to build on top of this and basically enabling you guys to be able to do that. Um, so I'm just gonna go very quickly over features if folks actually have specific interest in any one of these topics. We're just gonna go right into QA and after this. So we'll plan a demo. Well, yeah, we can do the demo. Do folks want, we can also do multiple demos if you want, by the way. <laughs> we have a very simple demo and we can do more complicated ones if you want. But less, as I've mentioned, open enclave features, basically we try and cover the basics of the four, sort of four major operations we've talked about just in terms of what we think are uh, essential for you to be able to write trusted execution environment applications uh, with. Um, just sort of as an enabler, we, we come up with a set of basic libraries because you imagine if you're trying to keep your application safe from the operating system, you don't really get a lot of functionality by default. Like you don't get your Linux system C library by default, right? So the Open Enclave SDK basically ships with a bunch of these libraries that you can use right off the bat to compile the applications uh, for these trusted execution environments. And for us, uh, we've chosen to use the embed TLS, which is also an open source crypto library. Uh, it's nice because it has a very small TCB. It was optimized for embedded systems. Um, we have a, basically a, a cut down variation of the libc, the Musa libc library. And we also support basically the LLVM libc++ library up to the C++11 standard. We're trying to get it to C++14 with caveats that there are specific subsets of functionality that we don't support for security reasons. So if you want to write an application, we're just not really going to support you opening sockets, which will go out into the untrusted world that have to be managed by the operating system, for example. So some basic things like file IO, those are not uh, included in the box with the Open Enclave SDK right off the bat. If you look at the next line, you'll see that one of the other things we're trying to do is to basically provide a set of POSIX primitives on top of that and sort of expand that optionally, right? So one of the, <laughs> the new modules that came up with the recent previous dot version release uh, was essentially a file system and IO uh, module that you can then link into your application if you want that functionality. So if you, have a, if you have an application that really needs, for example, to write sealed data out to disk, right? You can choose to compile that into your application, knowing that if you didn't need that, then that's not part of your TCB at all. So we expect to grow that as much as possible. We understand that there's basically a continuum of people who from we want to be super secure and we want the smallest possible footprint for this application through to we need quite a lot of POSIX in order for this application to work, right? And so we're, we're sort of trying to phase in different pieces of POSIX support potentially. Um, there are lots of different ways we can go with this support and therefore you know, community participation would really be really helpful in that space. If you have specific things you guys are interested in, we would love to hear about them. Um, Syscall handling infrastructure is also kind of what we talked about. Uh, primarily also we want to support people being able to deploy these things in containers, right? And so that's also working towards a piece of that. Um, the other last piece I've also spoken about already, which is we want to be able to support this across the operating systems. The upcoming one will basically be our first release where we have full experimental support for you to just build the application and just run it on a Windows host. Um, so that's basically it. I'm gonna turn it back to Andy now for a quick demo. So uh, the question for the audience, how many of you are developers and would like to see what a simple application written against this SDK would look like? Yay, awesome, lots of hands there. So I'm gonna go ahead and minimize this and find the exit button for the 
slide. There we go. The question you should ask is, or have been developers? Or have been, yep. <laughs> Past, present, future, anyone who's interested. So I'll start with just, uh, th this is the GitHub project. It is github.com slash open enclave slash open enclave. There's a website if you're interested as well that kind of goes over the high level overview, most of which we've covered in this talk. Um, you're free to take a look at the website, at the GitHub. If you do go to the GitHub, um, I hope that this is an easy to follow readme that should walk you through what the SDK is, how you would get started if you have SGX capable hardware. Um, if you don't have SGX capable hardware, we have a couple samples that do run in simulation mode, so you could still like look at this and see what it would look like to write against it. Just you obviously wouldn't get any guarantees of encryption there. Um, and if you actually did want to see the demo, let's uh, maximize, log back in. Live demo, by the way, not recorded. That's me. Not part of the demo. I promise, I logged in before. It just timed out. So we have the Hello World sample. It's a pretty simple sample. It's written in C. Um, it's kind of just the minimum code you need to uh, understand what an open enclave application is. I think the best place to start is to look at what is the enclave definition language file. It's uh, uh, EDL, the enclave definition language, is like a declarative sin. Um, what? What did DSL stand for? Declarative? No. Nope. Domain-specific <laughs> language. language. Thank you. Um, and so this just kind of gives you an overview of uh, what your APIs look like, like what are your trusted functions, what are your untrusted functions. And this file is real code. It gets processed through an edgerator that generates all of like, the marshaling code for your application. Um, so let's look at the trusted side of this. Uh, enclave.c is just a tiny little C file that implements the function that you saw prototype there, enclave hello world. It prints out that we were saying hello world from the enclave. From the host side, it's another fairly simple C file. Uh, most of this is, let me scroll back up here from the last demo. The first part here is, it's at the top of the screen there. Um, the implementation of the host side call out from, like the, the oh, call back from the enclave and the main function that is your host side application that you're running and inside you can see where you create an enclave using one of our APIs, the part that's generated for you, just go ahead and call it and you call into the enclave and you call the function that you described and compiled into an enclave. So that's all of the code, let's see if it works. Uh, being that we're targeting C and C++ code, we have both like package config files, if you use GNU make and package config, we also have a CMake package um, that's installed when you install like one of our Debian packages. And so you have a pretty simple CMake file um, to actually look at how this would be built. Uh, you import our package and it provides you some targets that handle all of the very annoying compilation flags to build code targeted for an enclave. Um, so you can dive into this. The sample is available in the GitHub. Um, actually looking at that enclave build, it's not too bad, right? We uh, generate our code by calling the edgerator. We create an executable called the enclave given the source files that we generated and the source file we wrote. Um, and we link it to open enclave libraries themselves. Um, does this all work? Let's find out. So I'm gonna hop over to my shell here. I'm gonna run a make clean just to prove that this is a live demo. We're gonna look at it and see there is no files built yet. So praying to the demo gods, make. Hey, everything built, that's great. And we can go ahead and run it as well and see what happens. And we did actually run the enclave, we signed the enclave, we uh, called into the enclave, it printed out hello world from the enclave, and then the enclave called back into the host to print hello world and our application exited. It really is, I wanna say, as simple as that. Uh, there's obviously a lot that goes into using an SDK like this, but we are working hard to make it easy to use uh, and easy to follow. Not in this, Demo, um, I've seen some cool demos that like pretend that you have a key in the enclave memory and then you dump out the memory. Um, that would be proving that the Intel side of this, like the SGX instructions are working and that you have the memory that you dump and oh look, you can't see the key and then you run in say a simulation mode and go, oh there's a key, those are some cool demos. Um, we could hook up a debugger and see that there's no way to access into that memory. I could certainly try that, it would be a fun end of the session. Um, but I'll <laughs> 
Come after the session. Yeah. If, we want to, if you want to hook up a debugger to this with me, I would be more than happy to. It'd be fun. Yeah. So I guess we don't really need to go to the end of the slideshow, but just to pull back up questions. Who's got questions for us? Yes. Questions? So uh, is the functionality in the SDK, is it uh, all built on existing plumbing and like an opti in the kernel, or are there, uh, is there additional functionality that needs to be added in? Uh, it's all, I think what you're asking is, do we, do we have to build any bridge code? Do, do you need to make modifications to the, to the kernel, or to opti, or any no. other? So, so, so it's all based on existing. Correct. So right. for well, I can't speak for the opt piece of that because opt is a little bit weird opti in that you you have to recompile for a specific configuration that you need to do, and I don't know whether they do anything special there. My understanding is that they don't, because a lot of that is is shimmed into the model that is on our side right. to adapt to that. Um, so, so more or less that if you right taking the SDK on an existing Linux right. platform, you basically got all the functions. Correct. Well, um, the to Right. Uh, drivers are not, not up to read. So you have all yes. the yeah, right. Correct. patches from against. Right. right. So for example, we, we take what Intel provides in terms of here's the out of tree driver today, right. and here's the set of uh, libraries that we will use for attestation, for example, right. and we just take that as a, as a dependency package. Right. right. So we try as much as possible not to have to go and invasively modify existing projects or existing code just to make the framework work. It is, Intel has a set of things that they provide, and we can just make use of that. Uh, similarly on Windows, on the Windows side, it's because it is part of the kernel, so we are a little bit more restricted in the sort of functionality that's provided there. Again, we don't try, like, we are an open source project, we have no say in what Windows kernel wants to do. And so some, some features, for example, that are available on Linux are not available on Windows today. Like um, the <coughs> Linux driver for Intel, for example, will do dynamic paging of EPC memory. So you can have technically unlimited memory space in your enclave because they'll try and page that out. Uh, Windows won't do that for you today. Right. right. So there are, there are sort of these differences that are just based on the platform that you're using. Right. Well, does that answer the question? Yes. Okay. Uh, other questions? <laughs> yes. So you bridging between untrusted and trusted nodes when you're running up So we don't actually give you guarantees if you go across that boundary today. So it's basically a syscall, it's a syscall trap layer, right? And so we, one of the things that we had on our roadmap was basically to implement a secure file system. And in that particular model, what we would do is we would mount an entire file system. And that would have, everything would basically be pre-encrypted. We would basically encrypt the, the file table as well. All of those things come with that. Another option was basically to make an adapter for Intel's um, secure file system as sort of an adapter piece, right? Because for file system, but for any other, again, right. about so sockets, sockets, for sockets, example, yeah. we don't do anything special to serialize the, the data packets to go across that. It's like, you want a socket, you get a socket, you're on your own here, right? So um, we're certainly interested in sort of ways of making that. There have actually been more research projects that talk about, well, we could sandbox it. You could have an enclave, and then within the enclave, there's a sandbox that handles essentially the writes out to untrusted memory space, right? Um, that's still a little bit speculative for us. So if folks are interested in that, we would love to have deeper discussions about that as well. Um, but it's sort of a, there's not been as compelling a use case for that in the sense that people tend to want to use that and want to use a TE. We sort of expect that you kind of know that you're gonna to have to encrypt your information, you're gonna to have to worry about these problems of serialization, they're not gonna try and do this in interesting multi-threaded ways where someone can hijack your file descriptor as you come. So things of that sort. It's, it's an optional module right now because there is clearly an elevated level of risk and developer knowledge for you to use that functionality. You specifically would need it when you're talking about your containerized. Uh, yeah. Because then you will talk about yes. simply bringing reality then you would have to face the 
reality because you would have to yes. again hedge in and out of your ad diffusion environment. Right. And um, again, some products which have to be present. Yes. <laughs> it's probably future work. It is. Thing. It is the magical bucket of <laughs> future work and backlog. Mm -hmm. May I do a brief plug for enough for the CCC more generally? Is that sure. Right? So, um, those of you who've heard about the confidential computing, I read consortium. Confcons. Sorry, may have heard there are other projects uh, which are going to that. Um, I'm from Red Hat. We have the NRF project, which is better. <laughs> Finish, but, uh, because we have stickers and they don't Shots seem fired. To, so uh, I'm willing to, to bribe you with a sticker. Um, right. Just so this, it's really, we've, we've had some really interesting conversations yeah. about we take yeah. very different models uh, of what we're trying to achieve and how we achieve it. Um, and the confidence of computing consortium is trying to encourage people to address these and understand what the options are. And mm -hmm. I speak for Scott, I so I say, well, we're looking for other countries who are interested in being involved in this. So I thought you were British, not Australian. <laughs> You're being so brash. I'm being very brash. So, but I have stickers, so I can <laughs> uh, So, yeah, I'm, a, I'm around uh, tomorrow as well. I'm, uh, you're around for a bit. We're very happy to the conversation yeah. to get touch. But Scott and Nicholas is going to talk about the conversation with CCC, where we hope to have loads of these discussions. Um, we're already planning the next to do that. So if you're interested, please see, well, your LF representative and uh, uh, me for a sticker if you want. Yes. Stickers, get on that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like marketing advantage is just gone, man. It's supposed to be the godfather. Yeah. <laughs> oh, um, but yes, I mean, you, uh, a lot of what we're trying to do with the Confidential Computing Consortium really is to bootstrap this for the industry, right? Like, we've, we've seen what the CNCF has done just in terms of getting a bunch of this technology sort of up and coming for just the industry to use in general. And this is really on, sort of on the cusp of that, right? There's sort of different projects trying to service slightly different models right now. Um, and the hope that this, the exchange of all this information is going to make much better platforms for just everybody to be able to use in general. One piece of software does not solve everyone's problems. This should be a collaborative and open effort among all of us. So, more questions. What was that Google project that you mentioned? <laughs> oh, no. Can anyone speak to that? You're being too British, man. This guy's really done a full on plug. <laughs> The idea that we uh, went through, again, very encouraged by Kubernetes and Istio, to go on a much higher level. It's still C++, but the goal is abstraction to a higher level than, I think, open enclave or Intel SDK that will help people to kind of use whatever their priorities and build those applications. And we also part of Confidential Computing Consortium for us because everything is abbreviated, the goal is people speak much easier, so it is nobody, nobody needs to remember those complicated words. Sounds like a cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> we should, so we should have, have a cocktail. cocktail. Oh, no, we, do, you, do you have sticks? <laughs> <laughs> so apparently, apparently, it's true. So that's true. It's only a red hat. <laughs> Trump again. Um, so yes, now for questions from the non-ringer section of the audience. It's <laughs> <laughs> real one. Yes. Um, anybody, like folks who showed up here, either you're really tired and just really needed the closest seat, or you're curious about something and happy to answer any questions you have. Doesn't have to be able to open on Clip SDK. Um, crickets, crickets. I have another question, simply to bootstrap this conversation. So we're all talking about removing trust from the system, from mm -hmm.
there's so many levels of abstractions that you're going to raise, mm -hmm. and so much code that you're writing. How, again, I am external party would be able to validate that open enclave and decay is not leaking much secrets. What is the mechanism for me to be sure that every single line of code that I'm relying on executing exactly as it's in standard and not opening those sockets? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because it's open source, right? Yeah. Open source is solving everything. Well, uh, I mean, it allows it, it allows it to be solved. Right. Yeah, but it's again open source. Talking about the code return, it doesn't provide verification, and in particular, grant lab verification of correctness of the code. So, so there, there are a couple of different pieces to this yeah. problem, right? So. Uh, clearly, open source is, is a major part of this because at, at the very least, you need to audit the code that you expect to be in there. Now, the next question that follows is, okay, I think this is the code. It's now some binary. Do I know what's in there, right? And there are a bunch of other conversations happening in this space right now because we've seen the supply chain attacks against you know, public open source projects where you really do care about things like how do you securely build this? How do I do like uh, full end-to-end -end, uh, reproducible builds, secure builds? And, and I can, right, exactly. So, so, you know, when I do a build, or we give you, for example, a containerized environment, like this is the source code, these are the build tool chains, right? It's gonna produce this binary with this particular hash. You can validate that on your own, right? So if we give you a drop in a Debian package, and that Debian package happens to have this hash, and you don't trust us, go take the source code they expect it to map to, go build in this environment that should produce exactly the same hash. And the assumption, of course, is you trust all the versions of the, build chain tools and that one and all that. And trust or verify to inform your trust. Yeah, right, trust, trust and then verify. Acceptable. Exactly. Mm -hmm. There's other things you can do. We make the decision to use Rust yeah. as our development yeah, language because good. it provides you with certain um, guarantees, guarantees in terms of what it's going to do and how it's going to allocate, right. how it's going to fault is also important. So uh, that's another uh, approach you can take and one we decided to, to use. Um, that's actually an interesting discussion I want to have with you later. Because that has also been on our radar. <laughs> yep. um, but there are, there are a bunch of other runtime types of things that we're looking at as well. Um, essentially, for example, static analysis of sort of runtime problems, like bugs are bugs, right? You want to basically flush as many of those out. And you know, visual audit is supposed to make bugs shallow, but you know, open source projects still get hit with CVEs all the time. So static analysis is another thing that we're starting to invest a little bit more in, um, just to be able to do like. Um, for example, there are tool chains out there like SEML, uh, a bunch of the Clang verification tools. So we've moved recently from GCC to Clang to be able to adopt, for example, more of the static verifiers. We're starting to look at different build environments where it's kind of hard to run existing tool chains on enclaves because, or use TEEs because by default you can't look into a TEE or you need a special debugger contract to understand how you actually read the information out of this memory space. So we're looking at, for example, virtual enclaves or just software implementations of the enclave so that you can run these tools and it will give you code coverage and you know, things of that nature to get you the kind of assurance that you need for the quality of the code that is actually running inside the enclave. And I, I really think that these questions are very good questions for CCC mm -hmm. to be investigating, right? I agree. Honestly. I think these are the same questions you'd ask about like NRX and ASILO as well, right? Yeah, yeah. of course. Um, it's the same question we have. Yeah. <laughs> Do we have any? How we can assure customers right. that mm -hmm. what we've done is as correct as possible, and yeah, those that there are techniques and tools we, we should be working together on for that as well. Yep. Questions? Do you have plans to extend beyond C to plus plus? Yes. Um, what form those plans take right now are a little bit up in the air. So containerization has been, has been mentioned as one of the things that we want to be able to do, right? So ultimately, we understand. Oh, sorry. Right. I'm an advocate of generating some Rust bindings. Golang, be Golang is something we've heard people ask about as well. Um, Go, Python. Go, Python. Python is actually the, the really big one, I suspect. Um, C Sharp, because Microsoft. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I made, the NRX project takes a very different uh, model, which is that uh, we provide a, will provide, maybe, um, a uh, web assembly. 
runtime environment. So anything that you can compile down into WebAssembly you can run. So that's you know, Haskell, Perl, Python, Rust, C, C++, C Sharp, Go. If it compiles down into WebAssembly, you can run it. So that's, that's the approach we take. It's, again, very different uh, way of looking at things. So transpilation is one, one approach. Um, the, when I mentioned containerization, for example, one of the things we're looking at, for example, is from the bottom up, we're looking at just supporting subsets of syscalls um, so to give you better compatibility. From the top-down approach, we're looking basically, for example, unikernels, library OSs, right? So if like, I wanna take you know, a, a unikernel and put it inside so that I can just run my application as if it has an operating system to support it, that's also something we're exploring right now, and that will support a range of runtimes once that's available. Um, does that answer your question? You can, sure. Um, other questions? <laughs>